In episode 26 of MobyCast, we conclude our micro series on Docker tips and tricks. In particular, we discuss security and pruning. Welcome to MobyCast, a weekly conversation about containerization, Docker, and modern software deployment. Let's jump right in. Welcome, Rich, Chris. It's another episode of MobyCast. What have you, hey. What, hey, what have you been up to this week, Chris? <laughs> yeah, so exciting times here at Kelsis. The, the team is growing, and um, we've been uh, busy trying to uh, hire uh, for, for a new position for a product manager. So I have been busy doing, doing interviews and meeting a lot of interesting folks and um, trying to find that, that perfect, perfect person to join our team. Yeah, we've also been hiring uh, mobile software developers and and uh, backend software developers. So it's been, oh my goodness, I've just I, my days are peppered with interviews. But it's been fun to meet so many great people. How about you, Rich? Are you growing your team? Yeah, so we have about five part time developers. Um, they're only part time because I can't seem to get away and out of the way. So. Right now, we're really focusing on on handing off all of the lead development to two people um, to get them up to full time, and then we'll start hiring junior developers. It's been a really difficult process for me to get away from billable hours, uh, <laughs> and and I'm really just you know painfully doing it the wrong way until I figure it out. <laughs> uh, I've definitely been there, um, and you and I have talked a lot about that. So I think you're doing a lot of the right right thing. Yeah, it's just a learning process. I'll get there eventually. <laughs> right. So we, last week we talked, uh, we did another talk on the tips and tricks from Adrian Moat's talk at DockerCon. And this week we have, I think, just a couple more to go through. Um, and they've just been providing such fun conversation that we think it's worth going all the way through the list. So Chris, can you just give us just a high level, a quick overview of what the talk was about? Sure, you bet. Um, so this was Again, a uh, grab bag collection of, of tips and tricks, just common pitfalls that folks have when using when using Docker. Um, and so Adrian is is part of the Docker Captains program, which is a collection of just Docker SMEs, experts working with the community, um, helping folks in the community adopt Docker. And so these are the, come some of the, the common patterns, pitfalls that folks run into. And um, so kind of, talk with some of the other Docker captains to see what their top issues that they saw um, along with his and put together a presentation of, Hey, here's some of the top things that we see out there. And hopefully these are helpful for folks. Cool. And so the last one we talked about was shutting down gracefully. And then it looks like we're about to be able to get into some security tips. Yes, indeed. So it's kind of interesting, right? Like this security, (laughs) it just keeps coming up. Right. And I don't, I mean, if, if we go back and, over all the MobyCast podcast, every time we mention security, I'm, I'm sure it's, it's. I don't know what the percentage is, but it's it's definitely um, it's definitely a, a pretty large number. Um, so in so security is you know always kind of should be top of mind. Um, it's a it's a wide open area of of just there's so many things to consider. Um, and so this in this particular breakout session, some tips on like. Just at the container level, what are what are a few things that you can do to kind of help um, in the area of security and and to to harden your image a little bit more, uh, your container a little bit more. So one of the the first things um, that he talked about was just you know use you can you can use this read only flag um, for Docker to to say that when you're um, when you're mounting a, a file system, you want that file system, the, the file, the, the, the volume mount to be read only. And so that limits, you know, the ability for, for the mutations you know, it doesn't allow for mutations to happen. And so it makes it um, just increases your security posture there a little bit. So if you don't need to do writing, um, use the read only flag um, on your volume mounts. So you're going to be, you have a volume mount that's going to be, re, you know, making some host file system available to your Docker image. Your Docker image is stateless, so it doesn't need to be writing anything to that host file system. So mount it as read-only and the, the container can read from it and not write to it. And then yeah. if your container becomes compromised by some external force, then that external force cannot write to the host file system or whatever other file system got mounted. Yeah, and, and actually um, maybe to... Uh 
clarify just a little bit. It may be a little bit more involved where it's the root file system of the container is is read only. Mm. Right. So um is that will, considered a volume mount? No. So the, in, in that particular, that that wouldn't be. So so this is um, you know full disclosure. I have not used this 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 flag um, okay. myself, and so I haven't had the chance to to play around with it. But you know, I think the important point here is that you can you can definitely limit the the surface area of 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 mutations, and um, so I, I believe you know, and kind of thinking through this more, I, I believe that this is more along the lines of you're just making your actual container itself read only so that you can't you, the file system of the container. So it's, it's not necessarily the volume mount. It's just the, the, the file system of the container itself, make it read only. And it goes along with the fact that, you know, for the most part, containers should be stateless. Um, sure. You know, they're just, everything is, is there in the image that it needs. It, 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 it instantiates itself. It's running. Um, and any state that it needs is done outside the container, um, like, you know, making calls to a database as, a, as another service or whatnot. So I almost uh, like that as a, not just a security feature, but as a, a best practices forcing function. Like, hey, guess what? It's read only. So don't write to this thing. Go figure out another way to store stuff if you need to store stuff than on the local file system. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you can use um, this in in concert with the, um, there's another flag for like tempfs. So like that would be the one case where like there's kind of like um, a potentially a, a real use case for for writing to the container file system is if you need just some temp files to, to work with as you do your work, right? <laughs> but, um, yeah, but haven't we learned that that can be really dangerous? Like if you open up any writing at all, all of a sudden you can, you can have a situation where you've got a container filling up the entire host hard drive or whatever. <laughs> You know, yeah, I mean, has without that, realizing it. So absolutely, that that opens you up to like just programming bugs where you're just not doing the right thing and cleaning up after yourself. But uh, <laughs> there are very real use cases where you need to have a temporary spot, right, to do things. I mean, sure. you could have a, a pipeline for for doing like image manipulations or or video encodings or something like that right where you're you're you have intermediate files that need to be output um, sure. and it just makes sense to to write them to disk um sure. as they move through so so having having that capability it may be required um but you can still you can still have this read only file system but you know use this this tempfs command line uh, this uh, parameter as well for docker to basically mount a a um, a temp uh, file system that you can use for those kinds of manipulations while still keeping the, the root file system read only. Just for the sake of argument, um, that may kind of hinder some of the security benefit that you get from just having everything read only because I, I can just imagine an, an attack vector is if I can get access somehow and I can start filling up a file system, then I can take down a whole service, even if it's tempfs. I can take down a whole service by filling up that temp FS and then all of a sudden all the other containers on the host start breaking and things fall apart. Uh, so from a security perspective, not being able to write at all um, is more secure than even having a temp FS. But yeah, I get it. You Sometimes you just need files to write to, to do some work. Um, but yeah, wouldn't, wouldn't any sort of writing um, that you allow to your, to your mounted file system opens up the security hole that they're trying to plug with read only right the idea so so one thing would be like okay this you know basically just like a you know denial of service or just instability from like <laughs> filling up a disk um but there's also the um and this is why they have like temp fs right like nothing important is in the, the temp file system so like the etsy password file is not there right so right, that right. that's that's where this read only comes into play like people like the ability to like, could you, can you change the password file? Right. Can you add a user account? Um, Mm -hmm. You know, like what if there is a volume mount that's established, right? Like somehow like someone accidentally does it like by having this read only flag, it would, it would allow it so that you can't make those right. So, so that's the, the real Mm -hmm. security benefit for doing, for doing the read only option with, with your, with your Docker container, right. Is to make sure that things like that can't happen. Hey, this is Rich. 
You might recognize me as the guy who introduces the show, but is pretty much silent during the meat of the podcast. The truth is, these topics are oftentimes incredibly complex, and I'm just too inexperienced to provide much value. What you might not know is that John and Chris created the training product to help developers of all skill sets get caught up to speed on AWS and Docker. If you're like me and feel underwater in these conversations, head on over to prodockertraining.com and get on the mailing list for the inaugural course. Okay, let's dive back in. What do we have next for security? Um, so the so the the next one, um, the second one um, is you know don't run as root, and so this is a this is a biggie, um, and I would say it feels like most images out there don't really do anything in this space, and and so by default they are running as root. A best a security best practice is to run at the 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 least privileged level that you need, right? Um, and given that by default, um, when when Docker instantiates a container, it's going to be running as as root. Um, like that's something that you need to do in your in your actual Docker um, image itself to change that. So so this is definitely um, very much encouraged. So set a user in your Docker file. So switch to a specific user um, so that you're not running as root. Um, And you've, you've seen some of the big major distributions out there um, make these changes over the last few years. So like Node.js is, is, you know, definitely very popular. Um, They do this inside their, their startup um, inside their Docker image. They'll, they'll switch to a specific user um, so that they're not running as root. That's awesome to hear because that's exactly where I was going to go. I was I was just going to make a, a call to action for anybody that's working on this type of software to not make it the default because that's where it becomes a problem, right? It's like if you make software developers out in the world work harder to do things the right way, guess what? They're going to do them the wrong way. So as as like open source developers and as people that work on Unix tools, you know, just making it easier to not do it the wrong way is, is going to help the whole world. So I'm glad to see that Node is, is already taking that upon themselves. Yeah, and, and this is very this is very much a um, it's the responsibility of the whoever's writing the, the image, um, who's creating that container. It's not a Docker problem, right? Because Docker is just like, your image could be any operating system in the world. It could have mm-hmm. any kind of configuration. Sure, you sure. could have two users in, defined in it. You could have a hundred users in it. Like Docker has no idea who to run it. So it just runs, it just says, I'm just going to run this as, as, you know, PID one. And so it's going to get root. Um, Mm -hmm. And it's really up to you to know, like you as the um, application developer, you know that best. And so it's up to you and your responsibility to say, okay, no, I'm not going to do it like that. I'm going to, I'll create this, this new user account with the right level of privilege and run it as that. And so that's why they give you the user command that's actually baked in as a Docker image command, right? Like, so that you can do that. Right, right. Makes sense. Yeah, I think about other things like Postgres, like how when you install it, it makes you make another user. Um, So I I get that at an operating system level, so Docker is just delivering operating systems, so it's not really their job. But but I also think that uh, as a group of people that make software, we should we should also not leave it in the business application developers' hands. Like someone lower level than that should be thinking about this. And and it sounds like with Node they have, and with some other um, sort of base image creators, there people are thinking about this to make sure that base images don't get out in the wild that have this flaw. Yeah, absolutely. It's 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 definitely one of those things where it's like, hey, we know that this is what should we should be doing you know, as best practice. And when you have these these images that are getting millions and millions of pulls and in their big open source um, projects with lots of eyeballs on them. Like you should definitely expect it, right. That they okay. should, they should be implementing these best practices. Right. Totally. So, agree. Yeah. So it's really for when like the case where you are kind of putting together something custom, like definitely keep this in mind. Cool. All right. What's next. I think we're moving on from security. We are. And so after that, um, you know, there's just a, a few more um, random tips just kind of make 
um, life a little bit, a little bit easier. So, you know, another thing talked about is just, um, we all use, you know, Docker, you know, if you, if you use Docker on a, on, you know, regular basis, you're, you're one of the typical commands you'll be doing is like Docker PS, right? And that's a way for you to see, here's all my containers that are currently running, um, and information about them. And so, uh, you know, it kind of points out that, Hey, the default output for this is pretty ugly. Like it's, it's not too terribly readable. A lot of times it'll, it'll line wrap as well. And there's just a lot of information there that kind of makes it hard to, to read and parse. So, um, you can, there is a, um, a for a dash dash format command line argument for Docker PS. And with that, it's very, um, flexible and, and allows you to have complete control over the formatting of that output. And so kind of gives them, you know, examples, like if you just want to have a table, a tabular format with the name of the container, along with what image it's using and its status, very easy to do something like that. And you can, you can do it as a command line argument for Docker PS when you're running it, or even better um, is to change your Docker configuration um, file to just say, this is what I want my PS format string to be. So if you, um, for most people, this is in your, your home directory in the, in the dot Docker directory underneath that, um, config JSON, go in there, add an entry for um, PS format and put in the value for that command line argument, that, that formatting string that you, that you prefer. Put that in there. And now whenever you do a Docker PS, you'll now see this nice format. So a little, you know, a little tip that, um, can end up uh, in being quite useful. Um, and uh, I think it's yeah. stuff like that. It's stuff like that that if you take the time to just know some of that stuff, it just is going to set you apart. It's you know if you're a software developer and and you, I just read a tweet three or four days ago that said something like, "I've been using Emacs for ten years and I'm still pretty awful at it." And it's like, don't be that person. Learn these things. Um, especially if you're kind of committed to something like if you're, if you're going to use Docker for more than a year, learn some of this stuff because it's going to, that's what really makes the, you know, the mythical 10 X developer is somebody who, who has taken the time to learn little things that, that shave minutes and seconds and, and just make life easier as opposed to somebody who just kind of learned a couple things and just reuses those same couple things over and over and over and over. Yeah, and I don't know about you, but I mean, I I don't know if I'm really sensitive to the messaging now, or it's just become more popular. But this whole idea of compounding interest, um, mm -hmm. and like if you just get one percent better today or this week, um, and you do that on a continual basis, that all adds up, right? So you right. end up be becoming like that 10x improvement after five years, right? Um, as opposed to not improving. So. <laughs> So the, yeah, th this is this is probably definitely one of those things, right? Where it's like it's a little tweak, it's a little it's a little improvement, but if you do, if you have a regular stream of these things, um, like they all add up, and and they do have a compounding effect. Right. Exactly. Cool. Are we done, or was there anything else we wanted to cover? Um, you know, as, as in in this particular talk, um, get, talked a little bit about cleaning up um, and you know, how you can get rid of, you know, old images, containers and volumes and networks. I think we, we've talked about this on previous, previous episodes. Um, so Docker now has the prune um, command. Mm -hmm. So take, take good use of that. So Docker system prune will clean up everything, run that every once in a while. Um, and you will free up tons of space um, on your machine. Um, so Docker system prune is your friend. <laughs> nice. Yes. And I think that wraps it up. So um, it was definitely a big, a big session with lots of great tips and also kind of sparked quite a bit of conversation with us. So I think we got three episodes out of this, three MobyCast ep episodes out of it, but it was fun and I think it was very worthwhile. So hopefully folks will take away some, some favorites from this. Great. Thanks, Chris. And thanks, Rich, um, for putting this together. Yeah. Thanks, guys. See you later. Take care. Bye-bye. Well, dear listener, you made it to the end. We appreciate your time and invite you to continue the conversation with us online. This episode, along with show notes and other valuable resources, is available at mobicast.fm forward slash 26. If you have any questions or additional insights, we encourage you to leave us a comment there. Thank you, and we'll see you again next week.